Okay, I'm Kim Titchener with uh, RecSafe with Wildlife and Bear Safety and More. We also have Sarah here from RecSafe with Wildlife and of course, Kat Cohen, who is, is uh, going to be doing our presentation today um, from beautiful golden British Columbia, where it was 11 degrees today, which is warm. And I can't imagine any bear wanting to stay inside of their den in such warm weather. And uh, she is at the Kicking Horse Grizzly Bear Refuge. Uh, if any of you have ever been to the beautiful Kicking Horse Resort to go skiing in the winter or maybe in the summer for a bike ride, um, there is a bear that lives there. And, and Kat is in charge of managing um, him and keeping him safe and happy. And uh, she's going to explain everything that she does there and her work with Boo. And I just want to thank all of you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we started Rec Safe with Wildlife back in 2021 in response to need by the public to get credible information on bear and wildlife safety. Uh, we offer, of course, these free classes throughout the spring, summer, and fall. We have courses on our website. You can learn about bear safety, you can learn about bear spray, and we also have a membership that's free. So we will email you when there are upcoming classes that are free. We will um, add, we, we keep adding video videos and lots of great downloadable PDFs. If you have children, there's some really great resources on there for kids kids as well. And at the end of the talk today, um, we will be doing some giveaways. We have some fun prizes. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to you, Kat, and uh, you can tell us all about yourself. Right on. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I am in Golden, as as uh, Kim mentioned. I'm really happy to hear that there's quite a few people, you know, from, from other areas um, around Canada, because that's definitely something I'm from Ontario originally. And, um, you know, the there wasn't as much bear safety um, or even wildlife, uh, talking about wildlife and recreating safely with them in in other places. And it's uh, it's definitely something that I think is totally required. You know, it's um, it's something that you get Canadians coming out to us here in Golden. And um, sometimes people really don't know what they're walking into and and you know, oh, there's a bear on the side of the road, or oh, I'm going on this hike, I'm definitely going to run into a bear, or, you know, and people don't know what to do. So I'm really happy that there's people really exploring, um, you know, different resources for learning about wildlife and recreating safely with them. So, um, well, anyways, with what I do, um, I manage the Kicking Horse Grizzly Bear Refuge. I've been looking after Boo for seven years now. I've been managing for the past three. Um, and, you know, um, Life took a bit of a turn. I initially was actually uh, working on becoming uh, a vet, a large animal vet in Ontario once upon a time. That was kind of the direction I was headed in. Um, and I found my way out west visiting my sister for a summer. What was supposed to be a summer turned into pretty much the bed the past decade. <laughs> I started working with bears in Lake Louise and Banff. Um, you know, I got to work on some interpretive projects there. I got to work on some research projects. Um, and of course, you know, working with grizzly bears, I was able to get some great hands-on experience in the parks. Um, and then of course, coming out to Golden, um, I started looking after Boo and, uh, it's, it's quite a unique facility, you know, especially with, um, working different husbandry aspects with different types of wildlife with animals. Um, I really, you know, I, I was really interested in kind of seeing how things were managed at this facility um, with the size of it. And we'll get into that. Um, but it's it's a very unique facility. Um, Boo is a very unique bear. Um, it's a really interesting place. If you haven't visit, visited us before, obviously, you know, <laughs> come out and see us anytime. Um, you know, Boo himself. He's a 21-year-old grizzly bear. Uh, he would have just turned 21 this January, and we'll get into reproduction. We'll talk a bit about that today as well. But he is uh, definitely, you know, the, the main man um, for us up at Kicking Horse. And uh, he just woke up on March 10th this year. So he's out. He's about. And today 
I just got off the mountain. So when you said bad hair, I was like, oh yeah, totally. Like I just took a helmet off. <laughs> I just got off the mountain and uh, finished giving Boo his first meal of the year today that I would give him. Um, he does get a lot of food on his own, but this time of year is pretty limited up there. Um, the refuge itself is actually situated halfway up the mountain. So it's right in the middle of the ski hill itself. And I think a lot of people are like, what? You're, it's a ski resort. What the heck do you have a bear doing in an enclosure in the middle of it? And honestly, space, you know, that's the best thing um, about our facility for sure. Um, there's a lot of great things, but he has 20 acres of uh, pretty varied terrain that he's able to explore. It's quite, quite the size and very terrain for sure. I'm definitely working on that at the moment, maintaining that fence line is something else. Um, and I'll show you some pictures of the enclosure itself, but kind of getting into it a bit more about the refuge here, just some main points. Of course, we're home to our resident grizzly bear, Boo. Um, we're the world's largest grizzly bear enclosure. Um, I've been able to learn from so many different facilities around the world about how to maintain large enclosures and from different facilities, different even zoos and, you know, refuges or sanctuaries. Um, you know, it's great. We have a really open dialogue with each other. Um, bear care uh, internationally has really changed over the years and people are are just learning and sharing so much more so um, I'm able to help out with other facilities um, with what we've been able to learn from our enclosure setup. Um, we are North America's largest brown bear enclosure so difference of course grizzlies are brown bears right um, a subspecies in this area so although we have the largest grizzly bear enclosure there are some very large brown bear enclosures um, over in Europe there's some great facilities run by Four Paws International if you look them up they're a great um, organization looking after and rescuing bears from some pretty dire circumstances and giving them nice big homes. So larger enclosures are becoming the norm when it comes to di different uh, different animals. Um, if they have to be in a captive situation, give them the best best uh, opportunity possible um, with with what resources we're able to give them. So uh, for us, we encompass twenty acres of natural mountainside habitat. That is Boo's enclosure itself. That doesn't count um, around the facility, um, like our interpretive walk or interpretive areas. That 20 acres is purely for Boo. Um, it's got pretty varied ecosystems and terrain in it as well. So, and I'll, I'll show you those photos while they, when they come up. Um, we actually help pioneer large enclosures here in North America. Um, so once again, I mentioned that, you know, I do a lot of work uh, with other facilities, um, talking to them about kind of maybe what could work for them to help make things a bit bigger, make things a bit more comfortable for their bears. Um, electric fence work, of course, is is uh, our, our main go-to for the enclosure itself. Um, but as I mentioned, luckily there's a lot more work going into larger enclosures um, in those facilities in North America. So we're pretty happy to have been able to, to help get that off the ground and show that, yeah, this, this works well and it's better for them. Um, we also helped pioneer grizzly cub raise and rehabilitation protocols and research because of Boo's situation, and we've become a leader in grizzly bear conservation education. Now, the grizzly bear uh, refuge itself at Kicking Horse actually opened um, back in 2003. So Boo was actually orphaned as a cub back in 2002. Um, Boo was orphaned at only about four or five months of age. He would have been born back in January, February, 2002 um, in the den. Of course, all bear cubs, they're born in the den during that time of year. Um, and finally left the den with mom for the first time up in the Wells area. So actually north of Golden, uh, Wells Gray, if you've ever been in that region. So he woke up with his mom out of the den for the first time with his two siblings um, back in around May, 2002. So he was tiny. Well, actually, when he was first found, um, this was only about a month after he would have emerged from the den for the first time with his mother. Um, he was about 12 pounds. Today, he's about 800 pounds. <laughs> um, so, you know, they're they're pretty tiny. In fact, when bear cubs are first born, they're 
they're very small. They could be almost as small as my hand. So um, it takes some development in the den for them to actually get to the point that you see the little bear cubs running, running around in the spring. So mom will actually go into the den in October and she won't actually leave the den in these areas anyway. And it does differ region to region, depending on snowpack, depending on what's available, what food is available for those bears. But uh, in that area, you know, with a good amount of snow, fairly similar to our bears here, going into the den around mid-October, mid-October to mid-November, and leaving the den for the first time with mom in, um, in around May, beginning of May, end of April. So once again, depending on the time of year, we've all seen, like last year, it was like everything was like a month behind, it seemed like. And this year, it's like everything's a month ahead. <laughs> so um, we're seeing a bit of a change. We'll get more into that in a bit. Um, but with Boo, you know, um, emerging for the first time out of the den that year, um, he saw the world for the first time. And, you know, come around May in the mountains, you start to see, you know, the grass is really coming up. Everything's starting to melt out in the valley. And we have something that's called following the green wave, basically, which is following the food source. So you have everything thawing out down in the valley and then slowly making its way up higher into more subalpine regions as that thaw continues. And as you have that, it's adding all these nutrients into the earth. You have the sun, of course, coming up and really having everything grow. We start to see things green up. And where will bears be, but where the food is, right? So mama bear, Boo's mom, she was right on the side of a highway. And that's typical um, come around June, you know, around here through June. Yeah, it's just like, just bears all over the sides of the road. And that's where people think, oh, there, there's so many bears in this area. It's like, no, nah, that's just kind of where the food is. That's where they're hanging out. That's where those resources are. So Boo's mom, actually, that time of year, there's just dandelions just coming up right off the side of that highway. There's a major highway between Wells and Quinell. And uh, she was foraging and picking out uh, some of the dandelions with her cubs. Now, a mama bear on the side of the highway, you know, you might be thinking like, why on earth would a smart mother, a seasoned mom even, keep her brand new cubs right off the side of a highway? And there's a few different things. There's a few different variables there for mom. And for her, it's so much, once again, finding that food source, finding those resources, dandelions packed full of vitamin C, excellent for mama bear waking up out of the den for the first time. And of course, you know, for the cubs themselves, just trying to find the right food to eat from mom, coming off of mom's milk, still going for it a bit. They're still having, um, go, going for mom's milk, but primarily, you know, they are starting to forage and figure out the world, trying to find what food to eat, what not to eat. And mom teaches her cubs everything, right? She's teaching her cubs what to eat, where to go, and how to keep themselves safe, right? But she's also teaching them how to navigate our landscapes too. You know, how do you go from A to B? How do you go from the top of that mountain where you've been deading in the rock and then all the way down to the valley and then going through the obstacle course that we set up for them, right? So mama bear is just trying to feed herself, navigate the landscape, navigate us, and of course, look after her cubs. Anybody who's a mom, you could probably probably <laughs> kind of feel that a bit. So um, with her, she's actually guarding her cubs right close to the tree line. So if there was any kind of threat or danger, you know, from the roadway, she could chase them off into the tree line to safety. The very first lesson a bear cub learns leaving the den is, of course, you know, a lot of playtime, but also clinging to mom for safety. And then, of course, climbing a tree. Now, even though grizzly bears aren't exactly known for their climbing skills, grizzly cubs are pretty good at it. And of course, mom just chases that cub up the tree, teach them, hey, get out of the way from safety. And unfortunately, Boo had to use this lesson very early on in life. Now, that day, it was June 4th, 2002. And Boo's mom right off the side of the road, of course, looking for these dandelions. And she's a bit on edge. You know, a few people had stopped that day, people going down the road. Her cubs were being rambunctious and a few people had seen her that day, some locals in the area who, you know, I think anybody who lives in bear country, especially in grizzly country in the mountains where you commonly see bears either on roadways, you get to know your neighbors, right? So 
kind of, oh, okay, I know of this bear and that bear who we see every year in this area. You know, maybe, oh, that's nice to see that black bear came out and she had cubs this year. That's great. So Boo's mom was actually pretty well known to that area. And people were happy to see her wake up with three cubs, which is also a great indication, a very healthy mama bear. Um, now that day while well, she was foraging on the side of the road, it wasn't so much about people stopping or her running onto the roadway that that did anything. Uh, she was keeping her distance and people were generally keeping their distance as well, except for an individual. Unfortunately, he actually came up to the side of the highway that day. He went a little bit further down the road and he went to the tree line. Um, and there was a couple of people who uh, a short time after this individual had stopped, had pulled over on a little bit of a roadside to view mama bear and the cubs from a distance and they're thinking you know they're visiting the area and thinking wow you know look at this mom and three brand new cubs of the year you know giving them their space and everything and um about to move off when they noticed that mom was reacting to something I actually saw her standing up on her hind legs now i think a lot of people when they see a bear standing up on their hind legs they think oh you know that hollywood depiction of the big angry grizzly bear not so much. It's mom just trying to look out like something is going on. I'm smelling something. I'm seeing further. I'm smelling further. And as she was going back down, she was going back down on all fours and she chased her cubs into the woods. That's right when a gunshot went off, unfortunately. So this individual had ended up poaching Boo's mom on the side of the highway that day. Um, you know, the reasoning here and there, there's talks, but ultimately, you know, it it can't, comes down to the fact that he didn't just take one bear out of that ecosystem that day. He took out all four. Um, reproducing females are of our grizzly bears, especially in interior mountain ecosystems like this one, are the second um, lowest reproducing land mammal in all of North America. Um, you know, you look at the musk ox, they have very low reproduction rates, but our grizzly bears you know, let's say you have about a five-year reproduction rate. Let's say on average, mom has two cubs. That's the average for a bear in mountain ecosystems where they have food sources, like mainly vegetation that they're going for. And those guys um, with those low reproduction rates, those those two cubs, I should say, um, those cubs basically have a 50-50 chance of survival with their mom. Without mom, it ends up being as low as 5%. It's tough. You know, that first year is crucial for a bear's life. It's crucial for them to learn those big lessons from mom, you know? So for them going and learning, hey, okay, this is where the good food is. This is where that berry patch we go back to every year. That's going to produce well for us because I know because my mom taught me. Look at, if we look at highways, um, the highway structures, you know, overpasses and underpasses that have been built along the Trans-Canada Highway. Those were marked there specifically because they're active wildlife corridors and we're actually seeing moms teaching their cubs and now enough time has gone by we have the data and we understand that those moms are crossing those areas teaching their cubs and as those cubs grow up and teach their young it's becoming generational you know they're they're very intelligent animals and definitely mimicking that behavior you know is is pretty key for them to learn you know even with uh we see even if you're watching a documentary or maybe you're lucky enough to do it on your own um, and you go out and you see mom with cubs, maybe they're fishing in a river on the salmon run if you're so lucky to see it. Um, look at those cubs, see what they're doing. They're looking at mom. If they're not playing and being rambunctious, they're taking a good look. They're soaking it all in. They're observing that behavior and then they're going to try and mimic it. Um, that's how they learn. And without mom in the picture, one, they don't have that in safety. And two, of course, they're not picking up on that. And especially thing with mountain ecosystems too, especially with those these areas, we only have so much habitat. We only have so much space. You know, you have these dense mountainous areas. We have these dense little valleys. You know, um, you look at the Bow Valley through Lake Louise, Banff, you know, for example, about 90% of that landscape is, a, is rock and ice. So when you have those growth cycles, so early in the year, in the spring, trying to kind of come up the mountain a little bit, you have this concentration of bears all in this one area. And then, of course, they're having to learn about how to navigate the area with us, too. So 
um, it's, it's, it's quite a bit for them. Um, with that, it was at that time, back in 2002, it was seen as an issue, a bit of an issue of public safety, not to mention with those cubs, they were fairly close to human use areas. Uh, so ultimately, they were just taken out of the out of that habitat altogether, um, whether they were euthanized or put in a zoo. But at that time, there's actually no such thing as raise and rehabilitation protocols for grizzly bears, not just here in BC, but across North America. So and, and looking at it internationally for brown bears is very limited. There wasn't a lot of research. There weren't any resources out there. And there was a facility uh, up at uh, Northern Lights Wildlife Society up in Smithers, British Columbia, that did come forward and they did say, hey, we'd love to take these cubs on. We believe that we can do it. Um, but ultimately, you know, the province said, we don't have the research. We don't have the background. The risk is too high. Let's, we're going to have to see our other options. And basically it came down to what do we do with these cubs? You know, after mom's taken out the picture. Now, one of the cubs... We don't really know the full story on what happened. There's a few different, there's a few different kind of mixed messages with that cub. I like to think it's still out there somewhere, but the odds are fairly low, unfortunately. Um, however, with the other two cubs, Boo and his brother Carrie, they listened to mom's first vital life lesson and they ran up that tree and they hung on to that tree for about tw 12 hours until they came down. So the conservation officers at that point, they were trying to make those decisions um, trying to figure out with the province, of course, trying to figure out what to do, where to put them. And ultimately, Grouse Mountain Endangered Species Refuge in North Vancouver piped up and they said, hey, we want to take them in. We have this facility set up for them. Um, they can come here and we could hold on to them. They already had two bears about a year older, uh, Grinder and Kula, who are there today. Um, and they went to that facility into a holding area. Uh, now, the thing was, Grouse Mountain said, we can hold on to them for now, <laughs> but, you know, four bears and about a five acre enclosure, we don't think it's going to be fair for them. We want to figure something else out, and we promise we're going to figure out a facility that will work for these two cubs. And they also decided to collaborate on research. Bit of a light bulb went off the heads of uh, the guys kind of directing what would soon be the Kicking Horse Grizzly Bear Refuge. And the idea was if we give them a large enough enclosure, enough space, enough varied ecosystem, basically a mini version of what grizzly, good grizzly bear habitat looks like in the wild. Can we observe those bears with more hands-off methods than other facilities and be able to observe and take on that data, get that information, and hopefully have some research that can be viable that we can use here in the province of British Columbia to one day start raising rehabilitation protocols. And I'm happy to say it worked. Now, the 20 acres enclosure, the facility itself, there's a lot going on with it. There's a lot happening in there. Um, and they found this one area that didn't have a lot of use. Uh, for the rest of the mountain had good visibility for us to observe and for people to enjoy and see bears and not be too in their space you know um, we knew that the cubs would never go back into the wild with the current protocols but we wanted to make sure that we were able to give them kind of the next best thing um, and so they decided to open up this one area on kicking horse and how it kind of came up was kicking horse and grouse mountain were actually owned by the same company, Ballastinum, an Austrian company um, owned them. And so that's how they kind of came together and had this pitch, this proposal, and thank God somebody said yes. <laughs> so they built the facility. Um, and finally, the Cubs were brought in on July 3rd, or July 8th, sorry, 2003. So they stayed at Grouse. Uh, they didn't have an active hibernation that first year. Uh, but they went into uh, they went into kind of a denning area, um, and then they were brought uh, in to be prepared to move to Kicking Horse here in Golden um, in July. So when they first were brought into the enclosure, is is pretty fantastic. That brings me to our, our next slide here. So um, there are two main objectives that we have here. Um, at the Kicking Horse Grizzly Bear Ref Refuge, of course, and that's public outreach and environmental education. So really understanding um, bears and understanding their ecosystem is pretty, pretty important, I think, when people visit an area, you know, do your research, know where you're going. And of course, apply it to what you have at home, too. Um, we've been able to reach out to millions of people all over the world 
um, in the time that that we've been open and operating, you know, from 2003 onwards, uh, we're still going strong. Our operating season typically starts May long weekend and goes till the end of September um, that people could come up and visit and see the facility. And we don't only talk about Boo Story, of course, we're talking a lot about bear safety. We're talking about how that the habitat around us is so crucial and how bears play such a key role, why it's important to understand what bears do in our ecosystems and why it's important to respect their space and how that trickle down effect eventually does come full circle. Um, and of course, our other objective here, better understanding husbandry methods um, for uh, raising rehabilitation programs for better, better understanding what we need. And that's something for those programs to be in place. Um, what kind of facility setup is best for bears going back into the wild if they are going into uh, facilities? Um, and of course, what's better for, for bears if they have to be in a captive situation? What's the best setup for them? So those are our two main objectives at the Bear Refuge. And it all started, as I mentioned, back in 2003. So here are some pictures of the early days. Um, that's, uh, the one, see, this is actually Carrie. This is Boo's brother. Um, and this is the two cubs at Grouse Mountain when they were first brought in. So obviously pretty, pretty scared of what's going on. A lot had happened to them. Um, this is one of the first tours, um, that went on just about mid to late July. So that was happening. So look at the size of them already. So going from 12 pounds <laughs> to, you know, four or 500 pounds or so pretty quickly. And this picture just on the right is actually the very first photo of Boo seeing his new home for the very first time. And of course, vet exam right here that went on back in, uh, yeah, October 1st, 2003. So it was a pre-hibernation exam. Now, Carrie Boo's brother, and to just sidebar here, Caribou, Caribou Mountain Range, where they're from. That's where the name comes from. Now, Carrie was um, a real go-getter. Like he was, you know, uh, um, looking around the enclosure, finding things to do, discovering, um, you know, making new day, day beds, digging out even a den, um, flipping over rocks, finding moths. Like really, he helped create so much of what we were able to base that research on and boo was observing his brother they really helped each other but boo definitely was kind of sitting back watching his brother a bit being like oh what's going on what's he doing um and then of course um following suit or taking it over from him where he could um you know carrie and boo showed so much to the world about what uh raise and release programs can be like uh, potentially, and what uh, bears, how they learn. You know, when mom isn't in the picture, how can those bear cubs just figure it out on their own? You know, that nature versus nurture. Um, and that was something that uh, we were able to quantify that data, apply it to those, that research. I'm happy to say today in British Columbia, we can raise and rehabilitate grizzly cubs back into the wild. And I have a little bit about that at the end of the presentation that I'll get into. Um, unfortunately, though, a very tough lesson came into play with Carrie as well, and that was his first hibernation or torpor, as I'll talk more about. Um, Carrie, unfortunately, you know, um, he went into the den seemingly fine, like everything was good. We did that pre-hibernation exam. The cubs were both in great shape, very healthy. Um, they came out of it just fine. The You want to find, like, if you're doing any kind of veterinary exam where they're sedated, you want to make sure that it's at a good point where it's not too close to hibernation and it's not too far away, especially if you're kind of looking at that metabolic rate, that slowing down process that they're already in. So you want to find that sweet spot. So typically that's when we do um, any kind of... If, if we do have to sedate Boo for a big vet visit or anything like that, that happens right like beginning of October. And that's been that's been common. Uh, that tells us that, OK, he's on the right track going into the den. However, for Carrie, what ended up happening was pretty spontaneous, not something that anybody was able to tell or track. Our autopsy um, showed that uh, Carrie actually ended up having a twisted small intestine at some point during um, his his torpor. So we're not too sure what what would have caused it, what happened. Um, but basically that twisted gut just ended up 
taking him all together. Um, you know, unfortunately losing Carrie was such a huge, huge, uh, kick to, to so much to everybody involved. It would have been amazing seeing the Cubs grow up together and being able to see the two Cubs developing those skill sets. Um, and of course, you know, Carrie living out his days in a, a pretty happy, healthy way. Um, but unfortunately that wasn't, that's not the case. That wasn't what happened. Uh, Boo himself, he was definitely looking around for his brother. Um, people always ask, you know, was Boo grieving? I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to tell. It's, uh, it's definitely, uh, um, bears are very communicative animals, you know, and how they, how you manage them in the wild or even in captivity, how you're managing yourself around them. They will tell you, um, you know, if, if you know what to look for, definitely. And bears are when you're trying to kind of find that sweet spot with them um about what okay what is working for you and what isn't it's pretty easy to see good example one time to add in to some extra food into boo's diet we do supplement his diet about 50 percent. the other half of the time he gets it himself from the enclosure um but at one point you know i've i had some i had a big donation of food come in and I was picking through it and some of it um it's with that like I don't think he had had before and I was thinking oh, I wonder what he would think of this so um I gave him it was what was it it was a red pepper it was just like a fresh red pepper and it was mixed in with his food and we scatter and we hide the food all around the enclosure and so I put it in an area that I could still see him get this red pepper because I really wanted to see what what he would think of it and sure enough he like goes over to it and he picks it up and he just like looks over at me and spits it out and just kind of has this look on his face, almost like, what, how dare you? Why would you give me that? And um, once again, I can't ever tell you exactly what he's feeling, but I'm pretty sure he hated that. <laughs> so they're very expressive animals. Um, so with Boo, you know, after the death of his brother, it was definitely, you know, seemingly that he was kind of looking around a bit for him and wondering what was going on. But it is natural for bear cubs, you know, after mom picks them out, says, all right, kids, you're on your own. They will stick together for a certain amount of time, then eventually find their own way. So at the end of the day, it does come down to resources for them, especially in areas where you don't have that abundant amount of food source, like you would maybe on the coasts where they have salmon runs coming through, you know, that's when you see big groups of bears maybe being able to tolerate each other in those circumstances. Maybe there's a great berry season. We might see a few bears in a certain area on the side of the mountain going for huckleberries or whatever's growing. Uh, but ultimately, you know, it comes down to food and those resources packing on the pound. So for Boo, he uh, he did move on and he was able to kind of pick up his socks as it were and figure out how to how to get himself around the enclosure and how to find certain food when uh, he knew he could rely on us for it. Um, you know, and, and mentioning that that's a big part of it is how do you supplement his diet without him knowing once again, bears that nose of theirs seven times greater than a bloodhound phenomenal sense of smell. When I first started hiding food around the enclosure for boo, he just followed my scent trail. So he would actually walk right by where he could actually see that food source or even smell it. He would like smell up a tree and be like, okay. There's definitely some food somewhere up in that tree, but I know if I follow Kat's scent trail right where she entered the fence, I'll follow it all the way and that way I'll get every little bit of food. And he does that every time. So what we've had to do is actually just kind of spread our scent, hike all around the enclosure when we are doing um, any kind of uh, enrichment for Boo, any kind of uh, supplementing his diet in, in any way. Another way that we manage um, Boo's diet is, of course, managing the enclosure itself, vegetation surveys, um, looking at berry density in our crop that grows in there. Uh, we have about 13 different species of berries that grow naturally in the enclosure, so encouraging Boo to go for those. Um, now, thing is, as well, the enclosure itself is based midway up the mountain, so it's roughly about around 5,000 feet above sea level. So, of course, during that growing season where things are coming up in the valley and bears are going down the valley, it's not like Boo can go for a nice little walk down to the valley. So we have to bring that up for him. So what we'll do is actually go around uh, some local trails. Um, you know, we'll work with different clubs in the area and help um, 
going to cut cut down some of the growth of maybe buffalo berries or huckleberries around those trails to prevent wild bears from going to those areas um, around homes or high human use areas. Uh, our park system does the same thing just to kind of prevent that human wildlife conflict. Same with us and we'll use those berries for boo and of course leaving what is growing out there, out there for the bears. Um, fruit trees in the area. We have a lot of fruit trees here in Golden. I'm looking at my backyard right now. I have five different fruit trees out there. That's for Boo, <laughs> uh, bringing that up for him. And we try to match that caloric intake. And for Boo as well, that nutritional value, like for example, this time of year, he's loving lettuce and starchy foods and um, kind of more hydrating foods as well. That's kind of what he's into. And, um, you know, certain times a year, for example, in dandelions, he'll like the root versus like in the flower. So we're looking at what he's eating, what he needs. And that's what our bears here are looking for as well. Whereas, you know, he'll totally go off those starchy foods as we get later into the season, funny enough. And then he's looking for more proteins. He's looking at more fats. So we're following that cycle that he naturally would and matching it. So he'll definitely tell you if he doesn't like something. <laughs> so that's for sure. So yeah, those are the early days of the bear refuge. Some nice photos there. Um, the place has changed dramatically. It's been through a lot of different evolutions. We've been through a lot of trial and error over the years, that's for sure. Um, a really interesting behavior that we've been able to observe from Boo is uh, and because of um, such a unique facility that we have is denning behavior. So these are pictures of Boo's natural den. Funny enough, Boo's natural den that he's he's built uh he's kind of gone around and found different parts of the enclosure um different areas where he's attempted different den sites over the years but this one that he has um that is, you can see a pretty good photo it's of uh, that trail camera image of him outside of it it's basically the cut down root system um of this big old spruce really mature trees that's a big thing those nice big mature trees that are are growing those are so expensive you know like they're so important for our wildlife um and for our bears especially you know black bears definitely you'll see kind of a bit more of a wide opening maybe uh for black bears we do have a very old black bear den in the enclosure that boo will go into and come and check out here and there and use as a day bed if it's a little chilly but this one is definitely the one that he was like okay i have the best food source nearby there's water nearby i have a great view of what my people are doing <laughs> of uh, of the whole area um and it's you know it's not gonna fall down on me that's something that they're definitely looking at the structure so those nice big root structures but for boo it's actually really big you know, I had uh, Dr. Lana Ciernello, she came up a couple of years ago. She's working with Project Rewild at the Grizzly Bear Foundation. And uh, she's working on, um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk I'll, I'll talk a bit more about Project Rewild at the end. But Lana, um, she's one of the top experts on the planet for, for our grizzly bears. And um, she specializes in learning about denning um different dens in different areas so she's been able to look at different den selection different bears across bc and she went in there with me one day and she was looking around she's like this is huge i'm like really she's like this is bigger than a maternal den like bigger than like a reproducing female and you know they'll make different runes for their cubs the cubs will kind of figure things out on their own and dig around in there and she's just like i wonder why so sure enough um this year, I was over in the UK. I was visiting a few different facilities um, and it, just kind of wanting to learn more about their different denning situations. And I went to, I was at the Calgary Zoo. I went and looked at their bear dens that their bears had made in their enclosures. And sure enough, they're all pretty big. And so I'm kind of thinking it's more of that extra energy that they might have because they're, of course, they're, they have all that food source. They're in hyperphagia. They're in that time of year where they're packing on all this weight. They're consuming all this energy. But in captivity, there's only so much space to run around. Whereas in the wild, our bears are just all over the mountains trying to find what they can. Um, so maybe maybe that's that's a reason why. But ultimately, that would be really interesting to study the differences on and why bears make bigger dens versus smaller dens or or what so just booze den 
he's made it much bigger than he needs to. It could also be because, you know, he does have his winter yard. So Boo doesn't actually stay in this den, unfortunately. Um, he would love to, he has, you know, we could see a couple pictures. Um, and that's where, um, you know, Boo was set up that year. Uh, but unfortunately, we can't hold him in the main habitat over the winter because it is an electric fence. Uh, we were able to pull it off a couple times, but ultimately the decision was made. We do need to have Boo in his winter yard and just make it a bit more, uh, make it as much as we can for him. And I'll show you what that looks like here. So this is his overwintering facility. So this is where he is right now. So you can see this was just a few days ago on the 15th um, of him rolling around uh, that little log cabin in his den. On the one side is my little area. I'm able to actually have a camera fitted in the den itself. And so I go up there with a laptop every day. So I'm able to monitor. You have to be very quiet. Um, and of course, monitor Boo as he dents. And then uh, this is kind of an overview drone shot of his overwintering facility. So you can see, can you guys see my mouse moving around? Yeah. So the den here, and then this area, it's actually double the size of that. So we have it split into two. But this area here, that's his holding area. So over the winter when he's sleeping, that area is closed off because it can withstand that heavy snowpack. It's all metal mesh, uh, heavy duty. I do have the top of it electrified. And then, of course, we do have this, which the next couple of days, his energy is just kind of coming up right now. In the next couple of days, I'm going to finish off a couple fence repairs here and then see if he feels like wandering into this area. Because this is where there's a big, beautiful pool. There's some nice mature trees. There's different areas to dig. He can play around in there. And that's because he's just moving out. He's reversing that process of him denning, um, going into the den for the long winter sleep, and then having to reverse everything again. So he's just starting to eat, but really what he's eating is basically lettuce, like just kind of trying to rehydrate himself. That's what he's looking for. He's looking more for water and those hydrating juicy foods that are coming up. And there's not a lot of that out there right now, as you can imagine. Um, so I have to give it to him. But also, you know, this is a bigger area for him to, to run around in. But the enclosure itself, you'll see another image coming up soon. Um, he, I'm working on digging that out of the snow fixing that fence and then releasing him into the main habitat. So he basically has three stages to um, get uh, back to <laughs> back into it for the uh, for the summer season. So yeah, that's our overwintering facility. Um, with that as well, I'll bring down whatever I can off the mountain um, for bedding material. So basically trying to make it as comfortable for him as possible. So we used to just use straw, which a lot of places, you know, for their bears, that's what they typically use. They use their straw bedding. It can get pretty dusty in there though. So I try to stay away from anything that can kind of produce that dust. Have some vents in there as well. I saw that Boo actually has a little vent at the top of his den. So we put that in there too. Um, and gave him, the thing is you want to give them as many options as possible. Once again, bears are intelligent animals. They have their individual choices. For example, I know some bears in different facilities that prefer using leaves over grass for using as bedding material. Um, they're just so individualistic. So the best thing for them is to give them as much as possible and let them choose basically. And that's what we do with Boo. So um, why guess when you could just kind of give them those options and he could pick and choose what, what he needs in his den. So um, he chose to basically have um, a different kind of uh, dried out fireweed, um, different vegetation from off the mountain that we gave him. Uh, he even brought in some pine with him, some spruce uh, berms. Um, I'll see, bring in. He brought in, one year he brought in a, an old bone just to kind of hug. It was, it was very sweet. Uh, um, he's, you know, he'll kind of drag certain things in there and make his bed as he pleases. But I'll get, typically use some mulch as a base for him so he could keep digging into it. And I won't use any kind of cedar mulch or anything like that. I'll just use like good old dirty mulch from somebody in town who was already mulching out their property. And that's the stuff because it's a bit more gritty, he can dig and it makes it just a bit more realistic for him. So that's the best thing as a base and then him having his bedding. Um, and he's happy as a clam with that. So seems pretty good. Um, big thing for him is always going to be space though. So making sure that I can maintain that secondary enclosure for him when his energy is back up is the most important thing.
So let's talk a little bit about hibernation as well. I wanted to get into that. Uh, do bears even hibernate? You know, and that's such a, uh, it's such a kind of complicated question because people um, use hibernation as, as a pretty umbrella term. And it is for sure to, to an extent. Um, but, you know, there's with bears, it's pretty individualistic for them. You know, we look at torpor in bears, that being kind of the more, technical down to a term you know people talk about brumation that's more for of course our reptiles um but what's the difference between a ground squirrel or a bird going into hibernation or torpor or versus a bear and uh it really does come down to well evolution you know they were able to evolve they're able to to go into the den for the winter to conserve that energy but ultimately for our bears, they always would need to kind of wake up and defend themselves as needed. So for them, we don't actually see the same temperature or metabolic drops in our bears as we do with other, other uh, animals going into hibernation. So torpor is definitely the term that we use for our bears. However, in that regard, you know, um, we do see them still dropping quite a bit rapidly rapidly when it comes to their heart rate, the respiratory rate, and their temperature compared to what we could do. Uh, another unique thing with our bears as well is when they go into the den, they're not urinating, they're not defecating, they're not consuming any kind of food, even though they can stir and come up. You know, for example, Boo this year, this was the first time we actually had him wake up through January, through through the winter at all. Usually once he's in there, he's in there and he's down. He'll wake up in the den for about 15 minutes a day or so, move around, stretch his legs, fluff the pillows a bit, and then he's back down again. But this year there's a couple different variables and that was definitely some temperature, but it's not all about temperature. It's about snowpack too. How easy is it for him to go out, pop around in the snow and dig up some leftovers from the fall that he might've left behind, which he does, which he's looking for now very slowly. But, you know, for him, it's all about, and not just for him, for all bears and really all wildlife, even for ourselves, you know, it's all about energy input versus energy output. That's what their whole life is about. So basically, how much energy is it going to be for me to go out of my den, go and trudge through and post hole through the deep snow and dig up? some food source. Is it worth it? No, I still have some good hibernation weight. I'm going back to bed. So bears will wake up, move around, sometimes even leave the den altogether, but they're not going to be going very far. Um, his, however, you know, um, one day he was up and moving around and, you know, he came out and I saw him and I was thinking, okay, this is interesting looking him over and he looked great. And he seemed like he was actually digging about then literally the next day, there's a little bit of a snowstorm and I look at the camera and I see his respiratory rate and I'm able to, to, to check his respiratory rate. He was down to about five breaths per minute the very next day. So it can vary. They can go from one extreme to the next. And that's the, once again, because those bears need to conserve their energy as much as possible. But also if they do need to kind of wake up and defend the den at any point, you know, they can get up and do that. So once again, the big debate with uh, a lot of a lot of people when it comes to hibernation versus torpor for our bears is more so that they don't have that same kind of temperature drop or even the same metabolic drop as other animals like our ground squirrels or even birds will, but they are still dropping pretty dramatically. Um, a big thing for bears as well, going into the den, um, that's pretty interesting of course, is, uh, is basically um, uh, their kidney function, um, not being able to go to the bathroom, not going and waking up and using the toilet. If we did that for even a week or two, I don't know, <laughs> uh, we wouldn't feel very good. We would basically poison ourselves. But for a bear, they're able to basically recycle all that urea, all those proteins, all of that that they would either uh, otherwise expel. Um, and they actually use that. Their kidney function is able to recycle that as pretty much more nutrients to get themselves through the winter. Uh, muscle mass is a big one as well, something that they're learning more currently, like today, they're just learning about it. Um, it's a big thing, you know, if anyone here has ever broken a leg or anything on your body, you know, I, I broke my leg a couple of years ago and the, it was, it's always, it always blows my mind looking at the difference, the photos of my leg after a couple of weeks on bed rest, you know, my broken leg and comparing it to 
my other leg that's healthy and strong, you know, and just looking at the size difference, just how quickly we lose muscle when we're on bed rest, right? Like muscle atrophy. And with bears, you know, they're all tucked in there, you know, for, from, you know, October all the way until May, you know, for reproducing females. And how are they not losing that muscle mass? And that's something we're learning more and more about with our bears. Um, and, and, you know, they are looking at more so the uh, non-essential amino acids and their proteins, uh, gene sequencing, sequencing for bears. And it's, it's all, it's all really interesting stuff that's just coming up that we're learning about to help apply to muscle atrophy therapy. And even, um, even with, a uh, um, osteo work too, looking at their bone, their bone density as well, because that's definitely something. Can you imagine being curled up in a tiny little space for a long amount of time? You know, if I even have like a long sleep, I'm waking up and oh, <laughs> so, so for him, it's definitely something, but it is all about reversing that process too, which we're seeing from Boo at the moment. He's got to go into it and then he comes out of it. And now he's coming out of it, the full process. So it's not like he's just going down for a little nap. His body is just completely shutting down when he's going into the den for torpor. It's not just snoozing. You know, when you're, when you're asleep, your brain is still working in so many ways, right? You're still fairly active, but in torpor, like you are in a whole different process, your whole met metabolic system, your whole endocrine system is completely just trying to slow itself down to the lowest point it can. So reversing that process for him and managing it is really, really important and really key. So, so yeah. So if do bears hibernate? Yeah, <laughs> but it's just a bit more technical than going down for, for a nap, like with, uh, with some of the other animals that we end up seeing, um, through the winter. All right. So another thing with Boo that we've been able to learn a lot about is his social behavior. Um, that's something, you know, and, and that's not just with people, but that's also with play. That's also with marking. That's also with other wildlife in the area. So that social behavior, you know, with him is obviously, you know, Boo is a habituated bear and um, he was raised by people. And, you know, he, as much as we try to hide his food all over the place and you know, try to increase that enrichment for him. He knows he's much smarter than that. People ask all the time, like, do you think he knows that you give him food? It's like, yeah, my smell is all over it. No matter how many things I've tried, he understands, yes, that food is coming from you. He even knows our truck specifically. And that's something even in the wild we see with our bears, you know, they'll end up um, in, in the parks. We definitely saw that. It's like one thing if they see, you know, a visitor to the area, their vehicle, say they're in like a gray Corolla coming up. They're like, oh, that's a car I haven't seen before. They're probably fine. But, you know, the white SUV with the parks, um, the parks uh, symbols on it and everything, well, they, they know what that one is and they're going to get out of there if they've had any kind of conditioning done versus conditioning. So with Boo, it's the same thing. If I, I try every so often to use a different truck, <laughs> <laughs> and that throws him off here and there. So um, half the time it's about tr trying to trick him and him outsmarting us. <laughs> um, and you just try harder because they definitely clue in. Um, you know, with uh, with Boo, he is very social with people. Um, you know, he is a bear on his own, but he definitely gets a lot of that, um, those social needs with us. And another one is definitely marking, you know, once again, the habitat itself. It's not like we're, you know, a city based zoo, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of different bears coming into the area. We have a lot of black bears on the mountain. We have a lot of grizzly bears that pass through. We have, we've had wolverine come through the area plenty of times, you know, there's all different kinds of smells from those bears. So Boo is actually able to kind of treat his perimeter like a bear would in a certain territory in the wild, you know, um, heavy marking around the habitat definitely shows us, you know, where is Boo spending most of his time. So for example, um, just noticing a lot of scat in one area that he usually wouldn't can indicate, oh, he's made a new day bed in this section of his enclosure. And sure enough, they'll find a new trail and a new day bed back there. Um, and, you know, marking, he has his favorite trees, you know, once again, rub trees when we're hiking through an area, 
paying attention to a tree that's kind of sticking out a little bit further. Um, and for Boo, it definitely is these two trees that he's rubbing on in this photo. They're at a nice high point. And what he'll do is he'll go over to the one side and he'll sit there at the top of this hill and he'll scent pretty heavily. You'll see him doing a Fleming's response. So basically for a bear, um, it's kind of wagging his tail, waving his tail back, or sorry, his tongue, <laughs> wagging his tail back and forth, like waving it around. Um, you know, you might have seen a Fleming's response in horses. They'll kind of stick their their um, mouth up, they'll kind of curl their lip back. That's just processing those hormones. For bears, it's it's the tongue wagging behavior. So you'll see him do that quite often. And then he'll turn around from the top of that hill. He'll push his paws into the ground, really putting that scent right into the earth. Um, and then he'll go up to those trees. Sometimes he'll start to walk and urinate too. That's a big scenting behavior. And that's really indicating he's smelling something over there or Sometimes he kind of looks at the whole crowd and kind of eyes them up. And he does this a lot in the early season when big groups start coming up. And he's just like, just so you know, this is my house. You're over there. I'm over here. Okay, that's the deal. So we see that quite often with him at the beginning. So he and with the new uh, any kind of new staff that, that we have coming in as well. So he's a very social guy. Um, you know, he has his moments and definitely a lot of playtime. And that's pretty unique, especially for a bear who's going into his golden years. He still plays uh, with hides. That's a favorite. I'll give him some cow hides for, for him as well. And he enjoys that. So very social guy. And we mark all that, all those behaviors down. And that, of course, is a great indication of happy health and, um, and of course, you know, his overall welfare. This is just a good kind of look at the enclosure itself. Unfortunately, the top part is cut off. So there's a little bit more to this photo. Sorry about that, guys. Um, this area, we have our viewing platform. We do have our interpretive area, this walking trail. You can walk up here and down here and uh, down this walkway and along the side. That's where uh, the denning or the winter yard is. Uh, right in the middle of the enclosure is a big wetland. So he gets uh, a ton of different hunting experiences in there, depending on what it is. For example, um, uh, tadpoles, frogs, salamanders, so on. Um, these are some other photos that you can see. There we go at the top. Um, he has a great cut right through the center of his habitat. And right in this area, these are where he's decided to make those different dens with the one den right over here in the center. So you can kind of see how it changes from season to season. And that seasonal variation is so important for your bear, especially in this area. They really do follow those environmental cues, those patterns. Um, and as the habitat changes uh, through the season, Boo reacts to those environmental cues. And that's basically what ends up telling him to go into this next life phase, whether it's hyperphagia or whether it's time to den down, basically. And typically, Boo will go into the den around as early as mid-November to as late as mid-December. Um, and then, of course, typically waking up around mid-March. Um, and this year, March 10th. So this is the earliest he's been awake in a while but he's woken up as late as April 5th. Once again, you know, what are the drivers for that? Well, it depends on the season, depends on snowpack, depends on how much energy input and output there is for him. So, so yeah, the enclosure itself, um, if you're ever up at Kicking Horse, you can see it from the gondola. If you're going up the gondola, it's between towers eight or nine, or you end up taking the catamount chair. It's a chairlift that takes you mid-mountain, get off at the mid-station and you walk up to see us. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's nice because, you know, I get a lot of people who are saying, where is he? He's not out right now. Um, worst time to come up and see him is midday. And that's most wildlife midday. It's hot, you know, in the summertime, once again, energy input, energy output. So when we look at our wildlife, our mornings are, are very busy, you know, midday is a bit down. And then as we get closer into the late afternoon, he becomes a lot more active. So uh, what's really nice about this enclosure as well is we can't have people walking around the entire perimeter of the enclosure. So it gives Boo space. It gives him his time. If he wants to come down and see people and kind of check everybody out and see what's going on, he can do so. Um, you know, we don't go up and around trying to find him. He basically comes down, and introduces himself as, as he pleases. And also we have a good way of kind of viewing him from either overhead in the gondola or being able to view him on that center slope 
but lots of areas, you know, nice dense trees, nice open glades. Those are really important. Yeah, there's about, I think now we've been able to manage about eight different micro ecosystems within the enclosure, um, which of course, you know, gives Boo that added variability, which has also helped us in the past with research for those raisin re rehabilitation programs. Once again, giving as many options as possible so they have choice. And then we're able to see those individuals form what works best for them. Now, this is, yeah, these are basically just a breakdown of our um, our vegetation surveys that we do and the different micro ecosystems that we have. So minus this one, I wouldn't really count this corner in because that's our overwinter yard. So this is the top of the enclosure. So this is west, basically. This is north, this is east, and then this is our south fence here. So we have our creek forest, which has a lot of uh, mixed conifer, uh, subalpine fir, um, and kind of mixed in there, but also some beautiful cedars through there as well. And here we have more so our spruce forest. Up here we have a bit more fir trees, primarily more subalpine fir. Uh, through here makes it almost like a bit of an avalanche slab, um, you know, being cleared out. So it makes things nice and open and uh, kind of leads right into our bogs area here. So we have our, our, our wetland through this area and then our heavy bogs. Um, and then, of course, you know, we have more so meadowy habitat for them there, nice wide open spaces. So it's uh, it's pretty varied in, in what's available in the enclosure. So setting wild behavior helps uh, improve captive welfare. So understanding what wildlife needs if they can't be in the wild, if they have to be in a captive situation. Uh, but how can an animal in captivity possibly help? our wildlife, and that's been a big question. Um, and ultimately it comes down to our raisin rehabilitation programs, as I mentioned. So Project to Rewild um, is being um, studied, is, a, is basically a world leading research program um, that we're looking at uh, with the Grizzly Bear Foundation. We're working alongside them to better understand uh, what grizzly bears need if they are going back into the wild. So basically if they're orphaned like Boo was, um, what, what can we do to help better their chances of survival? And Project Rewild is actually studying what our habit, what habitat, or sorry, studying our bears after they've been released out in the, out in a good bear habitat. Um, so it's about a five to 10 year project that they're currently working on. Dr. Lana Ciarnello, uh, is the head uh, researcher on it. She's been doing some incredible work out there. And of course, with those cubs, I'm happy to say that, uh, with Northern Lights Wildlife Society, who is the only facility in all of North America, one of the only facilities on the planet that can raise and rehabilitate grizzly bears back or brown bears back into the wild. Um, they've been able to raise and rehab, I believe the number is just over 30 grizzly cubs back into the wild since 2007, 2008. Um, and those cubs, um, there's been a lot of, of good things coming out of it and cubs actually being able to survive. And, you know, right now what they're really looking at is trying to find out what is doing it for them, what is working, what isn't, and can we actually solidify this so other facilities can start becoming accredited to raise and rehabilitate bears into the wild, not only here in British Columbia, but in other places around the world. So what is the best protocol? And of course, comes down to how, what husbandry methods work and what doesn't, you know, when we are raising them in captivity to go back for the purpose to go back into the wild, ultimately, you know, what, uh, what does it for them? What's going to really give them a leg up out there. And uh, we're very proud to be working alongside the Grizzly Bear Foundation with that. Um, and there's a lot that we're learning along the way to Boo's constantly teaching us. And we're constantly picking up more and more information every day. So it's, it's pretty exciting work um, coming up, being able to educate the public, being able to hang out with Boo every day. And of course, being able to continue learning so much about the, what these wonderful species are about. And, you know, I've been working with bears for 11 years now, something like that. And I'm constantly going out, constantly learning new information. And um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty fantastic just getting to know them so intimately and um, really seeing how well connected they are to their environment and just seeing how that whole ecosystem is basically umbrellaed by these bears. So 
for anybody kind of going out and seeing bears this year, if you're out and out for a hike, learn as much as you possibly can about them, learn how they, how to better live alongside them, learning so much about how that ecosystem needs them and uh, what we can do to help. Um, and really it's, it's going and learning and doing things like this that really, um, give people, I think, a different perspective on the natural spaces that they end up recreating and living in. And, um, you know, thank you so much to everybody for listening to me today, learning about Boo. And of course, for Rexay, for Sarah and Kim, um, for hosting me today. I really, really appreciated it. So uh, I love talking. I could talk forever, but I'll stop now. <laughs> and once again, thank you guys so much. I hope that was interesting. I hope you learned something today. So thank you. Thank you, Kat. That was uh, amazing. There's been so many questions. Sarah's been keeping track of it. And um, uh, Sarah, did you have some questions you wanted to, to share? Yes, absolutely. There is a lot. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Okay. Okay, let's start with this one. I love this question. Um, what is your favorite memory with Boo? Oh, um, oh man, there's been so many. There's a lot of really, um, you know, like bears definitely love their smells, right? So, but he just loves, um, he does love kind of sitting right at the top of the enclosure. He'll take you for a walk, you know, like you, you end up forming quite a relationship. Once again, bears are very communicative animals and, and Boo is a very social being and he will encourage you to go for a walk and he'll do that by basically walking up the fence line. And if you don't follow him, when he looks back at you, he'll come and get you and he'll start to paw at the fence. Oh. And it took a long time for everyone to kind of realize like, what is he doing? But basically he does that. And then I started walking with him and he's like, okay, we're going for a walk. So we'll go up, we'll do a perimeter check at the whole enclosure, but he likes to go up to the very top. And this is like, not just one memory. This is like, a constant one and uh uh but him just kind of sitting at the top of the enclosure with you and just kind of sitting out looking over the mountains and taking a good sniff and for him that's processing all that information having that high point for him is so important for him to be able to socialize and really you know just take take in his surroundings right for me and for all of us, we're very visual animals, but for bears, it's all about that olfaction. So for him, it's processing all that information, being able to just watch him enjoy it. It's just, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty awesome just to see him just being a bear. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, we have a question from six-year-old Jane, who is here watching the talk. Hi, Jane. Um, are bear years the same as human years and do they live as long as us? They don't. So bears, you know, can live if pretty, a pretty good age. You know, people are usually pretty surprised to hear that Boo's 21 and they think, oh, he must be pretty up there. Um, he's, you know, he's got a long time ahead. Uh, the oldest bear that I know of that lived, um, I, I did not meet this bear, it was before my time, but uh, he, he lived to about 46 years of age. So that's that's pretty up there. In the wild, typically we see bears living, you know, depending on what area, but even in the parks, we have some bears that are well into their late 20s, early 30s, you know. Um, a, uh, a biologist down south, um, he just, I think he collared a bear, he was about like 32, something like that, which is pretty phenomenal. And that, that was outside of the parks. So wow. yeah. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Clayton, Clayton Lamb, I think, did that. I believe so. I believe he was about 32 years old, that bear that he collared. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Um so will the refuge expand and take in more bears either now while Boo is alive or after? when Boo is gone? That, that's a really common question. I am working on it. Um, it is absolutely like after Boo is gone, it's been a big question, I think, for a lot of people saying what is the best thing for him, you know? And it's something that I've been working on with a couple different facilities who have done introductions with other bears 
um, and basically seeing what would be best in his circumstance. So I can't give anybody any uh, big answers right now. Um, but yes, there's uh, succession succession programming or um, a, a planning happening uh, at the moment. Okay. Um, what is Boo's favorite food? <laughs> Depends on the time of year, but pretty much every time, every time, salmon for sure. Yes. <laughs> pretty, pretty hard to beat that. He's a uh, that, and uh, um, we use it for enrichment purposes. All right, it's a, uh, it's pretty, it's it's easy to work with, but peanut butter. Mm, nice. So, I know our wild bears are not having any peanut butter. All right, everybody. But Boo gets some peanut butter if it's very high up in a tree. It's a high value thing. If we're working on him kind of discovering different areas because it is so motivating. So salmon and peanut butter. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, do you clean out Boo's den or does he do that himself when he's prepping for winter? Uh, for prepping for winter, um, cleaning out the den. Yeah, we want to make sure, um, you know, when I'm in the fall, like I'm going to take everything out because there is, you know, lice, you know, um, ends up kind of becoming a problem. Um, mm -hmm. Any kind of other parasites that might develop mold as one too. So yeah, I take everything out um, mm -hmm. and usually, you know, we'll take it out in a burn pile. Um, and then obviously airing out the den itself. So that's a big one because it is such, such a small space, you know, and you want it to be nice and cozy for him in the winter. We're trying to make mimic it as best we can. It gets pretty grungy. It gets pretty dusty. It gets, it could get moldy if we just leave it. So basically once I can, I'll just empty it all out. Okay. Yeah. Um, was the poacher ever caught for what he did yep um funny enough uh the guys who were actually sitting there watching the whole thing happen that day i forgot to mention that in the story they how they caught this individual was uh they got a picture of his license plate so okay. yeah, they ended up handing that over to the conservation authority the, the police when they when they came uh because those uh, those people watching they were observing they obviously saw this all happen and uh and called the authorities afterwards but you know the individual had already taken off at that point but he left her body there at the scene wow so yeah he got about a nine thousand dollar fine at that point so it, it, things have changed a bit when it comes to fines and definitely you know where grizzly bears in british columbia are considered a blue listed species so a species of special concern the sarah um act and um you know that is that is highly illegal for sure yeah Mm -hmm. especially off the side of a highway with a firearm yeah there's, there's a few different counts that, okay. uh, that he was prosecuted for okay um two more questions um does the electric fence affect other wildlife and has any wildlife ever tried to come into the enclosure oh yeah <laughs> that's uh something like we are smack dab in the center of a wildlife corridor with the grizzly bears it's really effective um i haven't had any other grizzly bears get into the enclosure or anything like that um the thing is and something that i am using this year um is having a different uh, colored wire you know typically with your permanent electric fences something really heavy duty it's in there you know it's hard to get different colored wire itself but the galvanized wire especially in darker areas on the north side of our enclosure it has a lot of shade right it's not as exposed um, and it can be harder for some wildlife to see so we have had um yeah especially little black bears you know we have um we have a high amount of reproducing females in the area so it's always the young this is almost always the case i think for any kind of pushing the envelope for any species really it's the young ones who are trying to kind of go off from mom for the first time they're discovering the area they smell this interesting space they they don't know what a grizzly bear is yet they probably haven't met one yet mm -hmm. um and they come up and they kind of poke their nose on the wire but the thing is if in the past we didn't have the wires separated why or or 
close enough. You know, they were fairly wide. So you get a little young black bear with his little narrow head going right through and he ends up getting a pinch on the back. It actually shoots him in rather than shooting out. Electric fences are designed to kind of be right on the nose, basically. So if that animal is checking it out, if an animal is in full flight, like going at it, for sure, if they get like a nose on it, they're going to bounce off. But if they end up getting a head in between those wires, if they're not close enough, then they can get into the enclosure. So yeah, we've definitely had black bears in the enclosure before. Um, and it's just a matter of getting them out. Boo at this point, he's really good about it. He just now knows like, okay, let's wander into this. I separate him from the main enclosure. Um, and basically we just do that based off of some emergency recalls that we have him worked on. Um, and then we just kind of try and find that little black bear and push him, push him out. Yeah. <laughs> and after that, they typically don't come back. <laughs> so oh yeah. Lesson learned. <laughs> so it, it happens from time to time. It's, it's pretty manageable on our end. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, we are right in the middle of it. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good way to have, um, with the electric fence, as opposed to having kind of heavy duty mesh around the entire thing, one for booze experience. So he can really see and smell outside of his enclosure. And two, you know, for the for smaller species, you know, I think a lot of people are thinking of more megafauna, like moose and deer and bears kind of going through that fence. That's that's easier to manage. That's made for them to not go in for the most part. Um, but for our smaller species, you know, seeing frogs going in, you know, making sure that thing it can still be a an active biome. So we still have squirrels go able to go in and out of the enclosure. We still have pine martens going in and out. We still have those smaller animals that are able to go from A to B. So it's still still a nice functioning ecosystem. Um, whereas, you know, you have big rates or chain link or anything like that in there, that's preventing quite a bit from really getting in to the enclosure as they need to. So the electric fence works pretty well with keeping things fully functioning. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that was perfect. <laughs> um, Someone was curious about the emergency recalls that Boo responds to um, when black bears get into the enclosure. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, I can't tell you what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, you know, with wildfires in the area, it became pretty um, obvious to us that we needed to figure something out. Um, and in general, like if if anything happens, you know, really um it's it's pretty necessary for any animal in captivity to have an emergency protocol right so with boo we have a couple different noises that he knows like it was once again bears very intelligent very communicative think about it in, in unfortunate circumstances you know we we've seen through history you know that we've seen bears trained on pretty interesting things heck they had bears riding bicycles you know so the fact that they can't learn um certain basic concepts to better their welfare is is a little naive so of course with boo for us it was kind of okay how do we have the hands-off method but still have him on certain protocols um you know he is he isn't going back into the wild he is in captivity that's the that that's the reality of it we try and keep things as natural as we can but ultimately we have we owe him uh um you know, um, that added enrichment. He loves learning. He loves that social dynamic. Um, and of course, it betters his overall welfare for emergencies and even with healthcare. So we do have Boo trained on a couple different things where I can weigh him, for example. Um, he knows to step on our scale and stand there for a second. Um, with that, um, uh, he knows his emergency recalls and he knows uh, to kind of show different sides of his body for healthcare checks. Um, and as well, showing his teeth, his nose, his lips, stuff like that. So we're able to do checks, his ears, he can show the side. So he's kind of learning those things and he really does enjoy learning. And of course it means he gets a snack. So, <laughs> so <laughs> then you call, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> we call it contra freeloading where, um, an animal will choose the kind of harder way to get the food source you know, which kind of goes against what bears are about, but you see Boo where, okay, there's this, there's the same food that I'm going to give you, but it's right over there. It's on the ground, but I'm going to ask for you to show your teeth. And he'd rather do that 
then go for the easy food of the same thing that's the treat that's just on on the ground work beside them so uh -huh. looking for that food that kind of dynamic of you know looking and searching and and uh being active actively um um enriching themselves in that way so it's it's uh it's pretty interesting to see and definitely something that we document every time it's part of our data collection every day cool awesome well i'm sorry but that's gonna have to be it for the questions everybody um we do have some prizes to give away uh, but thank you so much catherine for this presentation and for answering all the questions of course anytime thanks for having me Thank you. All right, so we are going to give away um, a scat belt. Kim Ooh. is showing you the scat belt. <laughs> Can you tell us about the scat belt? <laughs> <laughs> um, and a scat belt is actually is, is for you to hold your bear spray and then you can wear it over top of your clothes or over top of your jacket. Um, and a lot of people, you, you'll hear us say during our presentations, you'll, you'll see it in our, in our, in our courses that we, we really encourage people to wear bear spray, but we want you to wear it where you can grab it really easily. And if it's in your backpack or on a water bottle holder on your bike, it's not as easy to get to. And so we really encourage people to put it in a, an actual holster, practice pulling it out. And um, so Scat Belt is, is our sponsor um, at RecSafe. And so they uh, donate these, these Scat Belts at every single one of our talks. So if you don't win a talk, one of these Scat Belts tonight, um, you could certainly win one at one of our future talks throughout the spring and the summer and the fall. And uh, Sarah has already pre-raffle um done done a pre-raffle so she's gonna name off the person who won the scat belt today and she'll email you and and uh, get your address so she can send it to you all right so the winner of the scat belt is i don't have a last name but nicolina is the first name so i will just email you nicolina um for your scat belt congratulations that's awesome and then um, we have two more prizes and it is our, our bear safety course. It's, it's online on demand. So you can jump on, take the course. And if you're like, oh, I just wanna do an hour right now and I'll do the second hour later, you can do that. And then it's yours for life. And then every springtime, we really encourage you uh, before the bears come out uh, to go back, jump online and retake the course and refresh yourself. And if you have friends that you go out hiking with or family that you go out hiking with, you got family coming to visit, you're like, okay, we're all gonna go for a hike in bear country sit down with them and get them to watch this course with you so that everyone is on the same page about how they're going to behave when they're out in 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 bear country uh, and it's a two-hour course and um, we're giving it away for two people tonight and we give those away at every single uh one of our classes and if you don't win but you'd like to take it just go to rec safe with wildlife and we're offering everyone 20 percent off of our bear safety course tonight and the coupon code is boo bear and we'll we'll send you an email tomorrow um, so that you can get your coupon in case you decide you'd like to you'd like to take the course. Uh, but Sarah, who won tonight? All right, so we have two winners for that. So the first winner is Sheila Legit. Sheila Legit. Sheila. And Blaine Pearson also. No way! <laughs> wow, I know Blaine. I'm like, oh, oh no. Nice. <laughs> So many people out here good to know over the time as they keep coming back. So thank you <laughs> yeah. guys so much. Um, Sarah is going to email you and tomorrow we'll send out another email just to, to remind you. And we have recorded this. So um, there is, uh, we're going to get this up on YouTube. We'll put it on Facebook, link on Instagram and, and on our emails. And if you'd like to come to more of our free classes, we're going to do a whole bunch of them all through the spring, the summer, and the fall. We've got grizzly bear experts, wilderness first aid experts, um, other species. We'll have talks on cougars, on bear safety, bear spray, tons of different topics. If you have things that you want us to talk to you about, please just send us an email and let us know. And um, we will try to get a whole list of awesome speakers throughout the, the spring, summer, and fall this year. And um, lastly, I just also want to thank our volunteers. I know a lot of you are on here tonight. Thank you so much for spreading the word. We are trying to grow an online community of social influencers to help try to spread information on the importance of wildlife conservation, the importance of learning how to be smart and safe when you're out in the, in the wilderness and around your home, around these animals. They need all the help that we can give them. Um, and thank you again, Kat and, and Boo for your incredible story and, and life together out there at, uh, at Kicking Horse. So thanks for your time and everyone have a great night 
and we hope to see you at the next talk. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.